Good evening. On behalf of the American Chemical Society, Southern California section, I welcome you all to this annual seminar in connection with the celebration of International Women's Day and Women's History Month. Let me give you a short background. The first Women's Day celebration took place in Chicago on May 3rd, 1908, organized by United States Socialist Party, demanding economic and political equality for women. Later, it started being celebrated internationally and acted as a catalyst, a precursor for many important events in history, including the Russian Revolution of 1917. United Nations first celebrated the International Women's Day in 1975. And in 1977, the General Assembly adopted a resolution proclaiming it as UN Day for Women's Right and International Peace and marked March 8th of every year as International Women's Day. This year's theme is Break the Bias. It's quite relevant and significant theme in every aspect, especially at the time scientists in diverse fields are united to find a safe and sustainable solution to the problem, major problem faced by the humanity, which is the global warming. As chemists, one way or other, we all participate in this ongoing effort to mitigate the global warming, reduce by reducing the carbon footprint. Today, we are honored to have a great chemist and uh, an outstanding scientist who have been actively pursuing that effort. It is none other than our Professor Jenny Wei Yang from University of California, Irvine. I heartily welcome Professor Yang as our speaker to this event. Now, Professor Veronica Yaramillo, Chair of Women's Committee of our section, will formally introduce our speaker. Veronica. Okay, thank you. So it's my honor to introduce Jenny Yang. She was born and raised in the San Fernando Valley. And she attended the University of California, Berkeley and earned her BS in chemistry. She began her research career as an undergraduate with Professor Jeffrey Long and at, sum at summer research internships at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. She completed her PhD in inorganic chemistry at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology with Professor Daniel uh, Nor Sarah in 2007, followed by a postdoctoral appointment at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory with Daniel L with Dr. Daniel Du Bois. In 2009, she was hired as a senior staff scientist in the Center for Molecular Electrocatalysis at the Pacific Northwest National Lab. In 2011, she moved back to California as a research scientist in the Molecular Catalysis Group at the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis at the California Institute of Technology. She began her appointment as an assistant professor of chemistry at the University of California, Irvine in the summer of 2013. Her research interests we're going to be hearing about today, which, are, which have seem to have focused on inorganic electrocatalysis and uh, chemical fuels. So I'm very excited to hear all the work that she's been doing. So thank you so much for giving this talk. So I'm going to pass it over to Jenny. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm really honored to be um, giving this talk today. Um, let me go back up to my start here um, and then I'll share my screen. So. Um, I know that there's some undergraduates, uh, chemistry majors in the audience today, so I like to sometimes talk a little bit about my career path, um, which is a little bit unconventional for professors, uh, maybe not that unconventional, but 
um, as Veronica pointed out, um, I was an undergraduate at Berkeley. And what really got me excited about wanting to pursue my PhD was doing undergraduate research. It was basically my passion. And I was like, basically I said to my advisors, how do I get paid for doing this when I grow up? <laughs> like, how do I do this when I grow up? And all of a sudden you have to get a PhD first. Um, so I, I like to, to point out, cause I think not all undergraduates know this, but there are a lot of paid summer opportunities um, to do research. Um, you do have to plan a little bit ahead. A lot of the deadlines start um, coming in December, January for the prior year. Um, so the DOE Suli is the one that um, I did. Um, yeah, and then uh, the DOE Suli is the one that I did. Um, but that one usually is due in December or January. Um, and then the University of RU, uh, there are probably like 50 departments across the country that will have paid summer internships for this. And, and those are basically due January through March or so. Um, and you can apply to several of them. UCI actually, we have an RU program as well. Um, so you know, it's just a good way to get research experience um, and decide, you know, whether or not this is something you want to continue to do in graduate school. So I highly recommend getting involved in research. Um, I basically started it, my PhD wanting to be a professor. And then at the end, I wanted to work in the national lab where I had lots of experience as an undergraduate. Um, so then I postdoc at a national lab at PNNL, which is in Eastern Washington. Um, I was hired as a staff scientist and I thought I would um, spend my career there, to be honest, um, until I had an opportunity to go back to California um, and work at the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis. So um, Veronica pointed out, I grew up here, um, wanted to come back and it ended up, it was a, sort of a funny twist of fate. It wasn't really the right job for me, but um, when I decided it wasn't the right job for me after being there for you know less than a year, um, I found out from a couple of friends that Irvine was hiring. And so I applied there as well. So um, it, it was a little bit not completely straight, but you know, I, it was nice to get the extra experience along the way. Um, if you ask me what, what motivates me to be a scientist, um, basically, I really like to answer a lot of fundamental questions about chemistry and a lot of the problems that we work on are relevant to sustainability and renewable energy. You know, we're not an engineering lab necessarily, but we do like to, you know, sometimes we call it use-inspired basic research where the motivation um, has some application, but we obviously want to understand the fundamental principles as well. Um, this talk is for um, Women's History Month, um, International Women's Day. So I just wanted to talk a little bit um, about some things in my own journey. To be honest, the biggest challenge that I think I personally faced was sort of a confidence gap in whether I could do this. And, and secretly, I think the reason why I didn't want to be a professor after grad school is I, I didn't think I could. Um, and so uh, it's hard. Um, and but but I would say that, you know, it's don't so select yourself out of opportunities. There's been a lot of studies that show that women more often than men tend to do this uh, based on what they think their qualifications are. Um, I think building a support network and finding mentors is important as well. And then also overcoming your fear of rejection, which I agree is easier said than done. And, you know, but in, in, in science that happens a lot and the more you can sort of see it as part of the process, uh, it gets a little bit easier to really reach out there and put yourself out there for opportunities. Um, you know, one thing that I thought, I think when I was in graduate school was that academia was not very family friendly. Uh, I think there are still challenges and things that could be improved. Um, but I have two young kids um, who hopefully will not find me hiding in my bedroom upstairs uh, that are two and five um, that are downstairs eating dinner. So uh, it's definitely, you know, not a deal breaker either uh, to, to be, um, to have a family in academia. And I think that the more women do it, then it'll hopefully become more family friendly. I'm happy to talk about career paths and other things too, um, as well as the science behind my talk today. So um, the, the talk title is Managing CO2 Capture from Capture and Concentration to Conversion. Um, we do our work in this building um, that is an interdisciplinary science building um, that we just moved into last fall. And um, I'll give you a brief motivation behind some of the, what, we're, what we're interested in. So why do we care about CO2? Um, obviously, many of you have seen this, this graph, which is often called the Keeling curve. Uh, it was a scientist named Keeling that first started taking these measurements at Mauna Loa Observatory. I think it's been continued by a son, actually. So now it's still the Keeling curve. Um, it's still a Keeling that is taking this measurement. But essentially, you know, these, these levels are going up and they're causing a lot of impacts on our climate, uh, which are negative. And, but the problem is we don't wanna stop using energy, right? Um, in 2015, we estimated we use about 18.5 terawatts um, as, as humanity. And then it's projected to go up to 28 uh, by 2030 and, and 50 terawatts by 2050. So the question is, you know, we still need energy, uh, but the way, 
we've been using it um, has been putting CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, there used to be sort of a, I think, um, a discussion a few decades ago about how we we're going to run out of fossil fuels. I think most people believe that we actually have quite a bit that it's still on the ground um, and that we probably won't run out. So the left side is basically our total reserves. So that's like, you know, uh, the total amount that, it, that is still believed to exist. And I include their uranium as well, partly because it's not renewable. This is the one time reserve um, for nuclear energy. On the right side are our annual resources. So these are all renewable resources. And this is the amount uh, that is believed to be available each year um, for these different sources. So there are things like tidal and wave, which are smaller uh, renewable resources. And then you can go up to, you know, biomass is fairly large, but there's always, you know, competition between growing food uh, versus growing plants to, to generate biomass fuel. Um, there's wind, uh, which is fairly significant. And you can see solar is more than enough. Um, there's often a, a what is a citation that enough solar energy hits the planet in one hour to power humanity for a year. And you can sort of see that in this graph. Um, so solar energy is something that there's plenty of, uh, but what are some of the ch challenges to moving to 100% solar energy? Um, so I used to live in the Pacific Northwest and on the left is a graph of um, energy generation and consumption over time, over the course of a month. So for example, in the yellow lines, um, each yellow line is one day in a month. Um, in April and the solar energy generation. This is all normalized on the y-axis. And so clearly how much is generated each day will depend on the weather, whether it's cloudy or sunny, but no solar energy generated at night, right? Um, even if it varies during the day. Wind energy, of course, varies as, as well, uh, quite a bit depending on the weather. And then the last one is demand in red. And so demand is fairly constant, but our sources of renewable energy are intermittent. Um, they don't always match up with our demand. And so uh, this has become a problem as we have gone to more uh, renewable energy as part of our share um, of electricity. Um, and there are several articles that have talked about like, you know, running into the limit of renewables, which is that um, as we increase solar, then we're going to have to worry about this. And this is also a problem in Southern California as well uh, that we run into on very sunny days uh, where we overgenerate in the afternoon and then we have to sort of ramp up natural gas and other sources at night. Um, so, you know, a couple of years until I started my job, there was an article in Forbes magazine that basically talked about why energy storage is the most important technology. And it's basically because it will enable the use of these intermittent renewable energy sources by providing something more reliable. So when we think about energy storage, most people think first of batteries, and that makes sense because we all have them in our cell phones and our laptops, um, and they're pretty ubiquitous in our daily life. Um, so I have a graph here that basically shows energy density by volume and by weight uh, for different energy storage sources. And on the bottom left kind of corner is a lithium ion battery. Um, you might say, well, you drew your axes <laughs> to make it so that it looks like it's not very good. Um, but I would argue that there are actually things that are chemical fuels that are much, much, much better by energy dense and weight. And it's basically that chemical bonds are very energy dense. Um, so you can see there, there's a variety of different options that you can have for chemical, uh, chemical uh, fuels. Um, and so uh, former energy secretary Stephen Chu posited this question not long after he started um, his job um, under Obama. And he said, what is a Boeing 777 and a Bartel Godwit, which is this bird have in common? And the answer to that um, is that both of them can fly 7,000 miles without refueling. So why is that important? Well, if you're doing transportation, for example, uh, weight and volume matter when it comes to energy density. Um, and the reason for that is because uh, when you tr do travel, um, you need to carry your energy with you. And then the heavier and, and more bulky it is, then you have to carry more energy to carry the first part. And then you, know, you can see the, going down the spiral of very large things. And so it's very, um, it's a very unique trait actually to be able to fly 7,000 miles without having to refuel away. You have to have a very, very compact uh, energy source in order to do that. So, uh, you know, you could take a flight from LA to Sydney, that's 7,000 miles. And then when this bird uh, migrates from Alaska to New Zealand, uh, it's also about 7,000 miles. And of course, the energy that they use are in the top right corner of our graph. Um, the bird uses body fat and then the, um, the airplane uses diesel, gasoline, or jet fuel or something like that. Um, which is also very energy dense. Um, so the question is, how do we take excess solar energy and turn it into chemical fuels? Um, and you can kind of see the secret to that here because uh, we know things, uh, I guess I don't have any of them on here, but we know we make ethanol out of corn. Um, but the answer is photosynthesis, right? So this has been happening on the planet for a long time, a couple billion years, and uh, plants take 
sunlight and they oxidize water to O2 and then take those protons and electrons uh, into, take CO2 into fuel. And this happens on a scale of 110 gigatons of CO2 a year uh, get fixed through photosynthesis. And so the area that I work in is often called artificial photosynthesis. So the idea is that we want to be able to have a synthetic mechanism from which we can take sunlight and then do the same reactions or similar reactions where we oxidize water to O2 um, and, and protons, and then we use the electrons and protons to um, reduce uh, CO2 into uh, preferably liquid fuels. Um, and then these are called solar fuels. So of course, when we burn them, we'll again release CO2, but if the CO2 comes from the atmosphere, then we're not digging out of the ground. It's carbon neutral um, in this process. So um, these chemicals which require catalysts uh, in order to operate, um, and specifically electrocatalysts. These are catalysts that can take um, renewable electricity and turn them uh, into basically run these reactions uphill. Um, I sometimes like to explain what electrocatalyst is. I actually didn't do any electrochemistry until I went to my postdoc, so this is all new to me. Um, but if you think about redox catalysis, uh, very often you have a resting state C, and then once you oxidize or reduce it, it makes C prime, which is your active catalyst. Um, that C prime can then turn over a substrate to product at some catalytic rate. Um, and so this is something that we maybe we do more commonly in the lab, right? When we do synthesis, we'll use zinc as a reductant or uh, permanganate as a, as a stoichiometric oxidant. Um, so when we do electrocatalysis, we basically just replace that chemical oxidant or reductant with an electrode. And then that then becomes our electron sink um, or source, depending on whether we're doing oxidation or reduction. Um, and then we use that to basically go from C to C prime. Um, one metric for an electric catalyst is called overpotential. Um, so you have to apply some potential to get C to go to C prime, which is typically the redox potential. Um, and then there's going to be some um, thermodynamic standard potential for taking S to P. The difference between those two is called overpotential. A large overpotential means you're wasting a lot of energy. You have to add a lot of excess energy to get S to go to P. Uh, which doesn't um, happen uh, if it's more efficient, right? So a large overpotential means you're wasting energy to get from S to P. Um, other things is that we can get some information about the rate through the current because as C goes to C prime and then turns over and goes back to C to C prime, um, if we see a large increase in current, that means that catalyst is quite fast. Um, and then the last thing is Faraday efficiency, which is the percent of yield uh, to electron product, right? So it's basically, we know how many electrons we put in when we do this. And depending on the product that we get um, is our percent yield. Okay, so um, we're trying to do artificial photosynthesis. We're trying to make electrocatalysts that can basically run some of these similar reactions. And we know that nature does it really well. Uh, so just as an example of that, um, people have taken enzymes that can basically um, do some of the reactions that we're interested in, like taking protons and electrons to hydrogen um, or taking CO2 to formate or CO2 to, to CO and, um, and water. And these are all energy forming, um, sorry, energy storage reactions or uphole reactions that will store um, energy in the form of a chemical bond. And so some of the things that are characteristic about these enzymes is they're really, really good at what they do, right? So all of them are reversible, which basically means that they operate at the, at the thermodynamic potential. So they have virtually no overpotential. And you can see that because there's an oxidative and reductive current uh, for all of them um, on either side, right? So you can see uh, that. So, I, I, so there's sort of lines here, which I guess I can notate here. Uh, that's the thermodynamic potential where they cross. And then you can see there's uh, oxidation and reduction on either side of those. And they're quite fast at what they do. They're really good at it, again. And we would like to sort of uh, think about how to replicate that behavior. So if we think about formate dehydrogenase, which is a, a reversible catalyst, we could say, how can we achieve reversibility? Because by definition, reversibility uh, has to operate at basically a zero over potential. Um, if you've done some electric chemistry before, platinum is sort of a ubiquitous reversible catalyst for protons and H2, for example. So if we think about how we make formate um, in an electrocatalytic cycle, uh, we could start with a, uh, this will sort of be our resting catalyst here. And then we basically do that uh, two electron reduction to get to uh, the two electron reduced species. We protonate once to make the metal hydride um, here. And then we add CO2 to make formate. Okay. And then if we want to do this reversibly the way formate dehydrogenase does, uh, then we have to think about our energetic landscape. So this is a hypothetical energy landscape for a catalytic cycle. And if we have a very high energy intermediate like this one, 
then essentially what happens is that in order to access that intermediate, we have to apply more potential and that ends up being costing us an over potential. Um, if we have a very low energy enemy like this one, then you basically build in an int intrinsic barrier, uh, transition state barrier for rate, um, and that will affect your rate. So ideally, if you want to get a good reversible catalyst, you would have all the intermediates very close in energy to each other and very low transition state barriers to each other. And if that happens, you can sort of see how you can walk from one side to the other and then back again, right? So it's reversible um, get at that potential. So when we wanted to try to do this and, and make a, a compound that could basically mimic this reversible activity, um, we basically said, you know, that first step of hydride transfer to CO2 to make formate is the trickiest step. And so it turns out that there was a, a metal hydride in the literature that was known to have um, an equilibrium with CO2 and formate. So what I mean by that is that if we take this uh, platinum hydride compound and we add CO2 to it, it will end up uh, going into equilibrium between the hydride transfer product um, and, and the starting material. So the equilibrium constant for this reaction for CO2 transfer um, from a metal hydride to, to CO2 is basically effectively one, right? And so if we draw an energy landscape for that, we can convert you know, that equilibrium constant to delta G using this equation, which you hopefully remember from GenChem. Um, and we find that it's basically downhill by only 0.03 K cosmo. It's basically thermal neutral as far as we're concerned. I mean, it's really close, right? It's close to zero. And then we say, well, let's flesh out this catalytic cycle. So we have to protonate this platinum zero to make the platinum hydride. We know what the pKa of the hydride is. And so let's get a, a proton source to match that. Um, and so we found this proton source that is basically has a pKa of 29. So there's a little bit of downhill push uh, toward protonation, but it's also in equilibrium with each other. And we actually measure these equilibrium constants. Um, and so when we do that, we find that that platinum zero protonation of the platinum hydride is downhill by minus one kcal per mole as well. And then, so the last thing we need to do um, to complete our catalytic cycle is to do this electron transfer step, right? So basically there's, it's, it's a very simple proposed catalytic cycle. There's three intermediates, right? There's our resting state, our platinum two, it gets reduced uh, to the platinum zero and then protonation that it makes CO2 to formate. And so this uh, two electron couple is actually a reversible couple. And so that means that at that potential, um, the platinum two and the platinum zero are effectively uh, thermal neutral as well, right? When you're sitting at that um, reversible potential. And so what this tells us is that um, this uh, can, we can, we can do stoichiometric reversibility with this. Like we can start with a platinum zero, oxidize platinum two, protonate, add CO2 and, and go in the CO2 reduction uh, direction. We can also go backwards where we start with the platinum two, add formate, make the hydride, deprotonate, and then oxidize back again, right? So chemically, we were able to get this to go be reversible in both directions. Um, but the, the important thing I think was that we were also able to show that we could do it electrochemically as well. So on the left side is um, CO2 reduction of formate. Um, and so the way that we detect that is um, in black is just the, the compound itself and the two electron couple. In blue is when we add the acid source. The reason why it loses reversibility is because it protonates once you make the platinum zero. Um, and so the, you don't see the, the oxidation peak again. And then when we add CO2 and acid source, which is in red, then we see a small increase in current, which is consistent with catalysis. Uh, when we do formate oxidation, we can do that as well by adding in a formate and a base. And we see that increase in current here, which is consistent with uh, catalytic activity. And we do electrolysis to confirm that is in fact doing catalysis. So we are able to, show that we were to get electrochemical reversibility for CO2 formate in both directions. Um, and this was important because uh, no one had done this with a synthetic catalyst before. Before this, the only one that was reversible was the enzyme itself. Um, so what did we learn from this uh, sort of exercise where we sort of walked through this catalytic cycle and made sure everything was thermal neutral? Well, one, um, if we look, if we count all the downhill steps uh, to go one way in a catalytic cycle, we go downhill from CO2 to formate, uh, it's 1.1 kcals per mole. And so what this tells us is that when we need to basically go back here again to get the cycle over again, we need to add 1.1 kcals per mole to go back to that uh, starting material. Um, we can basically use that to effectively calculate the over potential for this catalyst, right? So we can use this other equation, which hopefully you remember from GenChem, uh, where we can calculate a free energy and turn it into um, um, the electrochemical potential, right? So this basically tells us that this is 48 millivolts um, 
of, of overpotential. This is one of the lowest overpotentials that's been observed for a catalyst for this reaction. Um, and that's very important because it sort of tells us a little bit about catalyst design. If we had inadvertently used a stronger acid, um, then basically we would be increasing the overpotential by 59 millivolts per pKa unit, uh, which is basically how many kcals be pushing it downhill. If we had used a stronger hydride donor, we'd also be pushing and increasing the overpotential by about 43 um, millivolts per kcal. And so you can sort of see here why this balance of getting everything equal, um, um, everything equal, equal uh, th close to thermal neutral is really important in order to achieve that low overpotential um, and that reversibility that's a consequence of that low overpotential. So one thing about this catalyst is that it's really slow um, in, in both directions. Um, when our first initial studies, we found that it was less than about 0.5 per second. Uh, so basically we walked through the different steps and we measured uh, kinetic um, uh, parameters for that. So electron transfer is fast. Um, protonation really, really fast, 10 to the three uh, per second. So we get a, a fast uh, observed rate constant. And then the one that's really slow is this rate determining step, uh, which is what we propose as a rate determining step because when we can isolate the hydride, add CO2 to it, and then we very, very slowly watch it add, uh, turn into formate. So this is about 10 to the minus four per second. So this is a problem. Uh, it is our, our, our slow step in our reaction. So it does have some very high uh, transition state barrier uh, to get this to add. And so, you know, we think, let's go back to formate dehydrogenase. Uh, this uh, catalyst uh, is reversible just like ours, but it's a lot faster. Uh, speed is important when we do catalysis. So uh, we like to see what we can learn from formate dehydrogenase. Um, in order to get that speed. And so if we look at the structure of uh, formate dehydrogenase, so we do do bio-inspired chemistry as well, um, it's basically a tungsten or molybdenum active site. Uh, so there's a lot of details here that um, you know, are very interesting, but I'm not gonna go into tonight. But the point is, is that in this, oops, uh, in this secondary coordination sphere here, uh, there are two residues that are conserved across all the different formate dehydrogenases that have been studied. And one of them in particular, we think is important, it's the arginine. So arginine looks like this, in case you forgot, which is okay, because I don't really do that much biochemistry. Um, and the important thing is that uh, with the pKa of arginine, uh, under biological conditions, it's protonating, it's cationic. And so um, Russ Hilly and Josie Mora have proposed that arginine plays a really, really important role in taking CO2 to formate and formate back to CO2. And the important role that it plays is that the transition state uh, you have this uh, very negative, uh, negatively charged transition state, and the arginine basically stabilizes it. And when you stabilize the transition state, you lower the energy, right? And then it can go faster. Um, and so they propose that this arginine plays this really cool, crucial role in this CH bond formation stem uh, for CO2. So the course of the question is, can we replicate that for our catalyst? Um, so at the time that we saw this, uh, we also noted that the literature had... Um, there were many reports about how cationic Lewis acids could accelerate CO2 hydrogenation, which also goes through a metal hydride intermediate. Um, but probably more importantly at the time is that Bernscott and Hazari um, did a study where they looked at uh, rate measurements and enhancements uh, with the addition of these Lewis, uh, cationic Lewis acids. Um, and they basically suggested that for some metal hydride insertion reactions, uh, which they call outer sphere reactions, you basically get this like uh, very charged negative species and then this cation can come over and help stabilize it. And then that's why they see that rate acceleration. So we tried it, um, you know, our, our rate insertion is very slow and we have not been able to get that improvement. So there's no uh, lithium or guanidinium salts. Guanidinium is sort of a proxy for, for arginine uh, that, that has been able to get our, our our improvement. So there's two things going on um, that we're still working on. And one is that um, maybe it needs to be positioned, maybe just tossing in some salts, it's not going to do it for you um, in terms of stabilizing transition state. Of course, enzymes are like, that is their thing, right? They can position, they can make these beautiful um, secondary coordination spheres where the interactions are very carefully controlled and we're just tossing in salt. So that might not be adequate. The other one is that it's possible the transition state doesn't have that um, very negative charge. And so the, the, the positive cation will not do much to help us there. So this is something we're still working on um, and that we're hoping to make more progress in showing how to do reversible uh, fast catalysis that, that mimics the enzyme in nature. So we have 
talked a lot about CO2 reduction and we're not the only ones. Like lots of people now do CO2 functionalization and they're very interested in basically using it as a feedstock material, which is very important. One thing that happened about two years ago is we thought, well, where does CO2 come from? Like we buy a tank, right? So where does that come from? Uh, there is no source that we can mine or dig for pure CO2. Um, it has to come from somewhere. And so it made us think, well, maybe we should think about this capture and purification. Um, what is the energy intensity of this process? And it turns out that um, the way that we are able to capture CO2 is not remotely efficient. Um, and if we actually want to use it as a precursor, we need to do it on a, on a pretty large scale. So uh, again, going a little bit back to Gen Chem, uh, we can figure out what the minimum energy it is to concentrate CO2. Uh, we can use this equation that takes partial pressures um, from, you know, whatever it is, but what's it in the atmosphere right now, 0.04% to 100% or something like that. And um, so that minimum energy for flue gas, which is about, which is a fossil fuel exhaust, about 10% CO2 to 100%, is about 5.7 kilojoules per mole of CO2. And direct air capture is 19 kilojoules per mole of CO2. So these are basically numbers from that above equation that we just, this is, a, this is the absolute minimum. You cannot beat this um, in terms of the cost of energy uh, to do this capture and concentration. The state of the art for flue gas right now is alcohol means. Um, they basically absorb CO2 from flue gas and then they desorb it using heat. Um, climb, there's a couple different companies that do direct air capture. Um, Climeworks, I think, probably gets the most attention right this second. Um, and they use sorbent materials that also desorb using uh, heat and then some reduced pressure. So what is their energy cost? Well, flue gas, which is well studied, um, it's sort of the technology behind clean coal, is pretty well known. It's about 190 kilojoules per mole. So we're looking at 3% efficiency uh, for flue gas capture. Direct air capture, Climeworks, it's harder to get a number because they're a company, but basically by our best estimates, it's about 16, uh, 650 kilojoules per mole. So you're looking at 3% energy efficiency. And in most of these cases, in all of these cases, energy is really the biggest cost um, associated with. So, so we're bad at this. Like we don't know how to do it well, I would argue. Um, and you know, we're, we're an electrochemistry group. And so we asked the question is, can we do this electrochemically? Because you know, electrochemistry is basically a source of energy. It's not thermal. Uh, these are often called electro, electro swing as when you use you know electrochemical work to do something instead of a thermal swing which is when you use heat to, to basically do work um, and so the thing about electrochemical uh, technologies for things like separations is that you're not Carnot limited you might remember Carnot from I don't know physics or something or thermodynamics but the point is, is that when you use heat and thermal swings you're always Carnot limited it's about 30 percent so even if you know uh, this got better you would still be at best 30% efficient, um, which was what I have say is not realistic, especially for direct air capture because the temperature swings would have to be too large. Um, we can use low cost of renewable electricity. Electricity is becoming cheaper because that's the primary form of generation for uh, renewable sources. And then you can work at low temperatures with high pressure desorption so we don't have to pay for compression costs. Um, and then it's smaller. So a lot of the thermal um, technologies you need like a block size plant. It's like a billion dollar capital investment, not billion dollar maybe, but uh, it's a lot of money. It's a big thing. Electrochemistry, if we had electrochemical designs that do this, we could have it like small and compact. People could have it on different places. It wouldn't be, uh, would, it wouldn't have to be uh, something that really um, got cheaper with size the way that a lot of thermal processes are. Okay, so um, what are we trying to do with electrochemical uh, capture and concentration? There's a couple strategies for doing this. I'm going to talk about one of them today. Uh, we are pursuing a couple of them, uh, but this one that we're doing is called redox carriers. Um, and so the idea is that you have a, um, I'm going to just go ahead and show uh, the, the right side too, which is how we think it would work. So the idea is that you have a molecule uh, R which is easily uh, has another oxidation accessible to it. In this case, it's the reduced state, R, R minus. And in that reduced state, it has a very high binding constant for CO2. So when it's reduced, it can capture CO2, right? It has some high binding constant, equilibrium binding constant. And then when it's oxidized in its native form back to R, it has a very low binding constant, so it releases it, right? Um, and then the way that you could see this working in um, my very non-engineering schematic on the right is that, you know, you have R minus in this absorption column, you put in your mixed dilute stream, uh, the CO2 depleted stream, you can just exhaust. Uh, R minus captures the CO2 that goes through, 
uh, you go through uh, an electrochemical cell where you oxidize it back to R again. Now it doesn't want CO2 anymore, so you get the concentrated CO2 out. You can take R and uh, re-reduce it back to R minus, um, and then basically use it to capture more CO2. So this is the electro swing, right? So you're going through oxidative reductive cycles in order to capture and release CO2. Um, and so I sort of told you about like sort of what we need, what are the requirements for doing a redox carrier CO2 capture cycle. Um, and so you might think, well, that's crazy. What kind of molecule uh, will have this kind of a behavior where it binds and reduces, uh, binds CO2 in one oxidation state very tightly and not at all in the other? Well, that actually has been known for a while, almost two decades. So um, about, um, about in 2003, this was reported with a quinone. Uh, so, you know, anytime you have this aromatic group with two uh, ketones on it, it's, it's basically a quinone. Um, and in its native form, the oxidized form, it basically has no affinity for CO2. Uh, so K2, K of CO2 is basically zero. But when you make the dianion, the reduced form, um, then uh, you get a uh, very high binding constant. So this particular one has a binding constant uh, 15, k to the, uh, it's 10 to the 15, right? Um, then look at log k1. And so basically it's easily, no problem taking CO2 from air concentrations, right? So what's the problem? If we've known this for 20 years, why aren't we doing this? Um, and, and they basically demonstrated that it works too. The problem is, is that this uh, dianion quinone is air, air sensitive, <laughs> O2 sensitive, that's a problem. Uh, because everything that we would wanna capture CO2 from is gonna have oxygen present. And so if our reduced species is air sensitive, um, basically this is what happens is that um, if your reduction potential is too negative, it'll do single electron transfer with O2 to make superoxide, which is a pretty facile electron transfer. Uh, you generate superoxide, um, and that basically is bad because it eats organics. Uh, plus, you quench your, you're basically quenching your um, capture agent when you do that. So the important properties uh, that we have to say uh, for a capture agent is, you know, it, it binds CO2 tightly when it's reduced, uh, no affinity for CO2 when it's oxidized, and now we need a redox potential that's positive for the O2 O2 minus couple so that we can uh, basically design in air stability for this compound. So just to talk to you a little about quinones is that, you know, people have then studied many quinones uh, to see whether or not they would be suitable for air capture. Um, they, they have a lot of the requirements that we're looking for. Uh, nice reversible redox chemistry. There's a lot of commercially available. They're uh, moderately easy to, to functionalize. Um, so why haven't any of them worked? Uh, when we plotted all the quinones that have been studied up um, until we started working on it, um, basically, uh, we can plot the log of the KCO2, which is, this is the binding constant, log of the binding constant, versus that E1 half metric that's very important for air stability. And we see there's a linear free energy relationship for that. So intuitively, this should make sense as a chemist, as you go to more reducing electron rich um, quinones, uh, they will bind CO2 much better, but of course, and they're more reducing, right? So they basically, these two properties scale with each other. Um, if we think about what requirements we need for flue gas capture, we need a binding constant of about 10 to the four. Um, and then if we want uh, capture from atmospheric, we need the log K to be about 10 to the six or 10 to the seven. Um, so those are the, the minimum requirements of binding constant that we need to capture from these different uh, gas streams. But our other requirement is that the redox potential has to be positive of the O2O2 minus couple. So the reason why it's a little bit of a broad band there is because it changes a little bit in different solvents, but that's basically what it is versus ferrocene in organics. And so this basically defines where we need to be to do air stable flue gas and atmospheric uh, CO2 capture. Uh, obviously no points exist there when we started, which is what the problem was with electrochemical capture. And so the question is how do we basically move into these regions, right? We want to go that way. We want to be able to uh, maintain binding constant or increase binding constant while moving to a, a milder potential. Um, so my student who worked on this first um, sort of looked at these tetrachloroquinones, uh, uh, which are circled here. So these are three different solvents that they're, they're measurement qualities. And he was like, wow, this is really close. Like if I just can like push this a little bit, we're, we're, in, the right, we're in the right region, right? So um, the first thing he did was he said, well, can, can we use another non-inductive method of modifying the redox potential? 
Um, and so he basically found an old paper which talked about how if you add alcohols to quinones, you can basically get fairly large shifts in reduction potential. So you can see here um, that when we add alcohols, it doesn't really affect the first reduction uh, peak, the TCQ to the semiquinone, but you can get these very large shifts uh, for the, to, to make the dianion species. And he was also able to see this interaction uh, by UV vis spectroscopy. So basically by adding the dianion with different alcohols, you see a shift, which is consistent with hydrogen bonding, but no protonation to make H2. So it's a true hydrogen bonding interaction, not an acid base interaction. So then the next question was, you know, we can make hydrogen bonds to these uh, oxygens in the dianion, but now can it still bind CO2? So Jeff studied that as well. And he also saw that the hydrogen bond interaction uh, impacted CO2 binding. Um, and so I won't get into the interpretation of all this data, uh, but I also say that in his um, electronic absorption spectra, he's also able to see those hydrogen bonding interactions for uh, what we propose is this carb uh, carbonate species, which is CO2 bound to the, to the oxygen O minus on the, on the dye anion. Um, but basically when he did further analysis, um, and I'm not gonna get too much in the details, but I'll just sort of give you the summary of it, is that um, the interaction of the alcohols with the, O minus on the dianion increases with alcohol pK. So that's maybe not too surprising. So the more acidic the alcohol is, you get a stronger hydrogen bond to the O minus. And that basically means that we get a larger shift uh, in redox potential. The problem that he noted was that when he then tried to measure CO2 binding, if that hydrogen bonding interaction is too strong, it will inhibit CO2 binding. Right, so basically you're blocking the CO2 binding by making a hydrogen bond to your dianion. Um, so he basically found, and then, and then if it's too weak, you don't really get the, the redox potential shift effect that we're looking for. So the, the point is it's Goldilocks, right? So like you need an interaction that's just right. If it's too strong, you inhibit CO2 binding. If it's too weak, you don't shift the redox potential enough. And so basically he found that this correlates with pKa and you can see here that, you know, there's sort of a magic region um, that he identified where the hydrogen bonding interaction was just right. Um, you know, not too, not too strong or not too weak. And it's basically around a pKa of 16. So he did most of his studies uh, from there on, on using ethanol, which is a very common, um, you know, solvent. It's a cheap solvent. And he basically found that, you know, if you add ethanol to these tetrachloroquinone solutions in DMF, then you increase both parameters uh, for CO2 capture, you get a nice redox potential shift positive. It will shift you, um, you know, into a safe place for O2. Um, and then it also actually increases binding by a small amount due to stabilization for the hydrogen bond, uh, which is pretty remarkable. So, you know, we're able to basically scoot this point over to here where now we're, we're basically in a region where we can actually capture flue gas um, in the presence of air. So the answer, the question is, does it work? Of course, we can, you know, do all these summaries and numbers and everything like that. Um, so Jeff set up a, a test bench to evaluate this carrier uh, under simulated flue gas conditions. You know, uh, basically we have an electrolysis cell, we have a gas mixer to um, put in the CO2, um, lean CO2 mixture, and then basically we have a CO2 analyzer at the end of it. Um, the answer from his um, studies is basically, uh, what happens is he starts here uh, with, uh, Captured, captured CO2 um, in the in the diana, the decarboxylate, and he finds that when he oxidizes it, so now it no longer wants CO2, we see that uh, CO2 released into the headspace. Um, and then when he oxidizes again, he recaptures that CO2. So basically he's able to cycle this through oxidation reduction oxidation cycle uh, in the presence of air. Um, this is basically a simulated flue, back, flue gas mixture uh, in the presence of air um, and basically uh, retain um, retain his species, right? So um, we believe this is the first example of O2 tolerant CO2 capture from flue gas, um, and that we were able to get the O2 stability, not by changing the quinone, which people had tried to do before and ended up on that scaling relationship, uh, but by basically adding something external to that, a secondary interaction, the hydrogen bond donor, um, to change the properties in the right direction. Um, based on the metrics that we've seen, uh, the energy efficiency of this process is about twice as good as state-of-the-art uh, alkanolamine thermal flue gas capture, and it's about twice as good as the best reported electrochemical uh, CO2 capture, which has not been air stable up to this point. So that was pretty exciting. 
And then of course, we're very excited about it because it is basically um, functions with two commercially available compounds, right? So ethanol is cheap and available and this uh, tetrachloroquinone is, is quite available as well. So we were quite excited about that. Um, we still need to optimize it and, and things like that and do longer stability studies, but we find that um, this result was, was quite significant in, in moving this area forward. So um, basically, you know, my dream, I guess, this is my ideal slide, is that uh, sometimes it's called the circular carbon economy. But basically the idea is that, you know, one, we're able to capture uh, and purify CO2 um, relatively efficiently, either from um, industrial sources, power generation, which is the flue gas now, which is currently just being exhausted in the air, or potentially air capture, which will actually be carbon negative. And then we can take that CO2 and sequester it. So it's funny, you might think it's funny that I have an oil pump there for sequestration, but I'm not an expert in the area, but I've, I've seen sort of convincing information that potentially you could use it, old oil wells as a way to store CO2. Um, I think they still are testing that as safety and other issues. Um, and then of course we can use it as a feedstock, uh, either for fuels, um, these carbon neutral solar fuels, which we can then recapture the CO2 or as a feedstock. So one of the things that, you know, I don't think we're going to be off fossil fuels immediately, but most of our carbon precursors in all of our materials and chemicals come from fossil fuels at one point or another. And it would be nice if we can transition into using carbon more as a precursor as well as we uh, stop using uh, fossil fuels. Um, this is a slightly outdated picture, but it has a lot of people that are in my talk in it. Um, so uh, the first book I talked to you about, the reversible catalysis, um, Drew Cunningham did most of that. Uh, Raina Velasquez was an undergraduate in my group who also contributed to that. Uh, Bianca did a lot of our early work on um, hydricity and, and metal hydrides. Uh, Jeff uh, actually also contributed to that, but he did uh, the bulk of the CO2 capture work um, that I talked about. And the CO2 reduction work that we uh, do is currently funded by the Department of Energy and the CO2 capture is by uh, a grant from the, from the Sloan Foundation. Um, so there are undergraduates and, and hopefully educators in the crowd. One of my former students started a company for educational chemistry games. I'm an inorganic chemist. It's called the Orbital Games. Um, they have a lot of fun things. And so uh, if this is something of interest to you and, and your students, then, then I would definitely check that out as well. I am happy to answer questions if uh, people are, have any questions. Hopefully they didn't go through that too quickly. Uh, hello, Dr. Yang. Huh? Um, my name is Brian. I'm uh, I'm a high school chemistry teacher, and okay. I had the I had the great fortune of having your inorganic two lecture in uh, spring of 2015. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, I have two questions. So may huh? I ask them both before you answer? Yeah. Okay, I have a couple of uh, highly capable uh, students in here today. They're in my high school chemistry class. And uh, I wanted to know if you had any advice for them in the pursuit of science and possibly even chemistry and what they could do. And then uh, my second question is personal interest in, uh, I remember you talking about the, the arginine substitute and huh? positioning that to assist uh -huh. the, the uh, that active site, and I'm I'm kind of interested in in how that positioning is done. Okay, uh, so those are both really good questions. Um, I will answer the first one first. About uh, let's see if I can get there, just so I have it up on the screen. Um, so the first question for high school students. Gosh, you know, it's funny. Like, um, well, one. Uh, there are universities that will take high school students for research, but I find that there are fewer um, in, in, in my lab, because we work with a lot of pyrophorics, I, I tend not to for safety reasons. Um, but there are some at UCI that do take high school students uh, for summer research. But I would say just, just follow your passion with it. I mean, I, I majored in chemistry because of the three sites, my, my parents wanted me to major in a STEM field. And of the three sciences I took in high school, I liked it the best. Um, and then, and then, like I said, I was sort of ambivalent about it. I was like, well, maybe I'll, I don't know what I'm gonna do with my degree. Um, but then I got into research and I'm like, this is so cool. This is what I wanna do. So I, I think if you 
follow your passion with that. Um, you know, look for those opportunities. I think one thing too also is that there are a lot of chemistry adjacent uh, engineering degrees as well. And so I didn't, you know, we don't take engineering in high school, at least I didn't. And so I didn't know anything about it. But when I took my first material science class, which was not until I was a junior as an elective, I was like, well, this is pretty cool too. But like, I just never thought of that as a major either. So definitely explore, you know, the chemical engineering and the material science. Those are all sort of like chemistry adjacent, um, even biomedical engineering, things like that um, as majors as well. So I, I guess that's my best advice for that um, since I don't, I don't work with high school students normally. Um, and then for this one, um, so the, the enzyme, you know, can, can uh, position that arginine through this protein scaffold. Um, how would we do it? Um, we, we've talked about this a lot in my lab. So my group, you know, we, we are a synthetic chemistry group, but, you know, my students don't like to do too much ligand synthesis or run too many columns or anything like that. And so we've sort of bounced around ideas on how to easily install charge onto the ligand. And we have some ideas, and I think we're actually pursuing some of them right now, um, of putting flexible charge on it, which will at least make it intramolecular, but it's harder to do rigid, basically. So we can try the, the intramolecular flexible charge, but yeah, we just have to try it and see if it works. Otherwise, we'll have to go to a more bridges scaffold. But the other thing is that we could, so I have another project with a collaborator that on artificial metalloproteins, and that's another way to basically, you know, cheat a little bit and use what nature has given us um, with scaffolding and, and try to position things. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much. I don't see any other questions in the chat, but thank you, Professor. This was a great webinar. Okay, thank you so much for coming on an evening and listening to me talk. <laughs> thank you, Jenny, for an excellent talk.